On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Shaw. And Shaw was raised by a narcissistic mother who scapegoated her at birth. It's a story of abandonment, self-harm, normalizing chaos, and going no contact for good. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone, and this is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of toxic relationships. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspectives. It is that simple. And now, before we get to our episode with Shaw, I first want to thank everyone in the Narcissist Apocalypse community for listening to the show and sharing your thoughts by email, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, a reminder, if you have not left us a review on whatever podcast service you use, Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, CastBox, etc., etc., please leave us a five-star written review as it helps out the show a lot when it comes to rankings. Now, if you haven't been to our website recently at NarcissistApocalypse.com and want to be part of our show, go to our website, NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page. You can find the guest form button there. You click on it, fill out the form. We go from there. If you also want to be on our show, but on our Letters to My Narcissist compilation episode, on the side of our page of NarcissistApocalypse.com, there's a floating button that says send voicemail. You press that button, it records up to five minutes. You need to record more. You press it twice, three times, and so on and so on. And if you don't want to read the letter yourself and you want me or my old pal Melissa to read your letter for you, send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com and put letters to my narcissist in the subject line. Other things. On our site, we are now offering high-conflict parenting courses. That can be found at NarcissistApocalypse.com slash courses. Yes, we have partnered with online parenting, and many of the courses we are offering are created by the great Bill Eddy. And if you listened to our episode last year with a divorce lawyer named Helen, you'll know that Bill Eddy is an expert in dealing with these individuals in court, and now he's helped create many parenting courses to help you through divorce and to help support your children, too. These courses are the most widely recognized courses by family courts across the country, so if you want to support the show and are looking for guidance, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com slash courses. And you can also support our show by joining our Patreon. Yes, we have a Patreon. If you want to hear episodes that never made it to air, follow up episodes with former guests and much more. What is that much more? We also have virtual support groups in our own support forum board there. Our virtual groups are rocking and rolling every Wednesday and Saturday. So if you want to support our show and you want to also have some support as well, become a patron of our Patreon at patreon.com slash Narcissist Apocalypse. Anyway, before we start this episode with Shaw, I just want to say a couple of trigger warnings. There is child abuse that is child sexual abuse that is discussed in this episode, as well as uh, suicide that is discussed in this episode and self-harm as well. This episode is on the longer end. I was going to edit the episode, but I didn't know where to cut it because it seemed like all the information in this episode was necessary. This episode is kind of two stories, you know, the childhood story and the story of when she is adult and how her mom changed uh, in those times. And it was, it's uh, a very interesting story. So keep on going because as the story unfolds, there's more story within the story later on. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it makes sense to me. So I just want to thank Shaw for being part of our show. And without further ado, here is my episode with Shaw. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have Shaw. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. A little anxious, but 
good. <laughs> well, everyone is nervous when they're in your seat. A lot of the time people are telling mm-hmm. their story for the first time the whole entire way through mm-hmm. to anyone and, you know, to me, a stranger. And uh, I just want to thank you for being here. This is a family story. This is about your mom. And yeah. your story is interesting in the sense of, you know, you felt that you were uh, not liked from the beginning. And mm-hmm. two, you have the an interesting a dynamic where you have uh, a brother, but you have different mm-hmm. fathers. And obviously, uh, one is supported and, and you're, mm-hmm. you are not. So it's a, you know, a, mm-hmm. a tale of uh, two stories. And Mm -hmm. uh, two struggles, I I guess. And it's uh, heartbreaking in in that sense because you're watching your brother uh, have Mm -hmm. some sort of uh, life outside of your mom who's destructive. So I've given Mm -hmm. away too much already, uh, but (laughs) it's a really interesting story uh, as far as uh, people who might have gone through that dynamic um, growing up Mm -hmm. uh, just like you did. So uh, thank you for being here, and I'm just going to get out of your way, Shaw. The floor is now yours. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I just want to start by kind of giving a little history on what I know of, you know, how my mom was raised. And, um, you know, she she had a really horrible childhood. Um, I don't know everything, but I know um, she's one of five all five of them have either, you know, addiction problems, mental health problems, um, and whatnot. Um, her, her family life, you know, I know that she was raped, I think twice when she was younger, once by her uncle, I believe. Um, and she, she struggled with addictions. Um, she, so she, basically had um, met my brother's dad and this was in another, you know, they moved to another state and she eventually got married and had my brother and that marriage didn't last long. Um, From what I was told, she was forced to get an abortion by my brother's father after she had my brother And that was what ended the marriage. But I really don't take anything she says too seriously because I I don't know um, what the truth is. So she moves back to, you know, where we are from. And she has my brother and she meets my father, who I was told it was like this fairy tale um, meeting. And she just fell in love with him. And um, he you know, they had lived together with my brother. And um, from what I'm told, when she got pregnant with me, um, that was when she found out she was pregnant with me, he was already like gone. I guess he had left the house and never came back. And, you know, apparently he was cheating on her. She had told him that she was pregnant. And he said, it's not mine. That's the thing that he said, because he has four kids in total, I believe, which I don't talk to him. So I don't really have a relationship with anybody um, that has to do with my father. But um, he would say that. That was like a thing that he would say is, I'm sterile. I can't have kids. So he told my mother that. And, um, you know, then I come eventually and, you know, it's, it's very spotty for me. I had a lot of traumatic things happen from like the, I guess from birth to like the age of eight. So, um, it's, it's spotty, but I just, for as far as I could remember, she, she always had this, uh, like, I just knew in my soul that she did not like me. You know, and and I don't say that for pity, but, you know, when you just know that someone doesn't, it was like the look in her eyes since I'm young, since I'm young. And she just did not like me. I think, I honestly feel like I was, number one, I came out and I looked just like my father. 
And I think that she was so tormented by what he had done to her that at that point she didn't even want me, you know? And um, I think that it caused, it, it just, we never messed well, ever, ever. And so, you know, um, when my father at that point, um, they had to do a paternity test in court. It was like a whole thing, you know, and, and it came out that obviously I'm his and um, he was in and out. He would, he, he would come into my life whenever he, he felt he wanted to, and then he wouldn't. But I remember, um, you know, getting dressed up as a little kid and waiting for him and then he wouldn't come. You know, and I think those instances also affected my mom because my mom was a partier. She was, she was pretty. She had friends and she, she didn't want to be bothered. Honestly, she always acted as if she didn't want to be bothered with kids. My brother would go visit his father every summer and certain holidays he would go. So for the most part, one of her kids was at least gone for, you know, an entire summer and and all of that. And then she had me and it was like, I was, I, like I, I said, I, I felt like a burden all the time. And, and I was, I was a burden on her. And, um, so my mom was a single mother raising, you know, the two kids and she was always in a relationship. So now at this point, which I'm still young, you know, she starts, dating women and um it was just very normal for me I didn't really think anything of it I, I think my brother struggled with it but I was fine I didn't really you know think anything of it but I always remembered she was never single she always like as soon as she broke up with someone a week later she was back in a relationship and that's just how it was. And she went out a lot and I was babysat a lot. And I had one main babysitter, but I guess the times that that babysitter couldn't ba watch me, um, she would have other people, you know, and um, there was someone who had lived next to my grandmother and which is my mother's mom. And, you know, it was an apartment building. So say my grandma was, you know, apartment A, this person was apartment B. And sometimes when my regular babysitter couldn't watch me, this one would. And um, she had two sons and a husband. And I, I you know, this is where things kind of get spotty for me because I don't know an exact age, but I do know that it was, between the ages of, you know, three and, and five, I want to say, um, give or take. And so uh, I would go, I don't remember the first time it happened, but I would go to um, this babysitter's house and there were times, and I didn't go all the time, but there were times that I went and she would go in side and, and go take a nap. And I would be sitting, and how it was set up was like, you walked in her house and the, not the house, an apartment. And the, it was the living room at first. And then the further you walked in, that was like the kitchen and the room. So the living room was as soon as you walked in. So she was in the back napping with her um, son and it was just me and her husband. And um, I... I don't remember the first time it happened, but I know it happened quite a few times. Um, I think after the first time it would happen any time I would go there. And he, I wasn't raped, but I was molested. Um, and it happened, like I said, I would say maybe a handful of times. Um, and that I think, well, I know really just change the course of who I was or who I was going to become as an adult. So I was very young and I didn't know anything. And, and he, and he scared me because he told me that I couldn't say anything. It was like, 
classic what you read in, you know, books and, and stuff like that. It was, you can't say anything. You'll get in so much trouble. Um, you know, and I'm young. I'm a, I'm a baby, like literally baby. And I was scared. And so, um, you know, it's weird. A lot of things from that time period, I don't really, it's really spotty. And so back to, you know, the relationships that my mom was in. So now I had that going on and I'm not knowing really what's going on with me, but I'm affected in some way. And then my mom was in an abusive relationship with a female. And I remember they would get into this fight. And I remember one time specifically where um, it was a really, really bad fight. And I, I was always um, a scared child. My mom, from, from as long as I can remember, I always feared her. And not in a physical sense, even though she was scary, but um, more in a, like, she was just so mean. And I was petrified. Like, I, I didn't, I was, I would, I would, um, when she would get mad at me, as, as far back as I could remember, she would get mad at me and yell at me. And it was always rage and hate, always. And she would I would just automatically um, turn mute. I would just cry and not say a word. And she would ask me whatever it was that I was in trouble for. She would say, answer my question. And I would just stare at her. Like I could, I was like, um, like immobilized by fear. It was, it was, and I just remember that feeling. And so back to the, sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. Um, back to the fight that she had with her ex um it was right across the room from my brother and I and I I remember hearing a glass like break against the wall and then you just heard scuffling and I started crying and my brother he held me in a corner and was just rocking me back and forth and the next thing I remember was my mom hearing her being thrown down the stairs and it was, I don't, I I don't really remember if I thought like she had died or, or what, but I just remember being so afraid. And, um, and then the next day, you know, she had a black eye, she had her arm in a sling. We were leaving. Everything was very fast. Anytime she left someone, it was in the matter of like, a week and then boom, we were moved into a new place and it was as if it never happened. So, so, uh, so, sorry. So right here, you know, the things mm -hmm. that have kind of gone on are, you you Mm -hmm. know, you were uh, molested when you were very young, you know, and you have, uh, you know, you haven't dealt with the fallout of that. And, and your mom at this point hasn't addressed that. Um, no, two, you she doesn't ha- know at that point. At that point. And two, you have mm-hmm. your brother who has, uh, your dad, his dad, you have you and your dad. Uh, you have this feeling of most likely, um, you know, just wondering, I assume if you're good enough because, you know, this guy mm-hmm. over here has all of this. How come I don't have anything? And wondering, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you're stuck with your mom. You're feeling like you're a mm-hmm. burden, and you know, your brother gets to go to these places and have like to be around mm-hmm. nice people, and mm-hmm. like you're sitting there probably wondering, like, like uh, at some sort of loss, or at least there may be a hole in you as far as like, mm-hmm. um, how come I don't get that? And uh, like a, uh, you know, he gets this mm-hmm. warmth and love somewhere else, and I'm not getting that anywhere. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, throw on top of, of that, you have your mom who is, uh, raging and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she gets angry and you're, you're afraid Mm -hmm. of, uh, I guess her put downs and and all those things, but now you have, uh, her being, um, you know, uh, abused as well or, or beat up 
uh, in these situations. Mm -hmm. So do you, uh, when that happens and you have this view of your mom in one way and now you see her the other way, do you have like a, a weird mixed message of how you feel about your mom? Because you're like, feel, oh my God, look what's happened to her. Um, mm -hmm. and do you forget that? Is that, is, is that kind of start playing out here where you're very confused as far as, um, you know, should I be concerned about my mom or should I dislike my mom? Um, I think at that point I was too young. Okay. You know, I, 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 I think that all of this was so normal to me, you know, like I was just brought into the craziness. It did, it wasn't like normal and then turned crazy so I think for me I always had this even as I got older I always had this weird attachment with my mom where even though I I hated her and I knew like as I got older I mean I knew that there was something wrong and I knew that what she was doing wasn't right as far as the way she was towards me but at the same time, for instance, I couldn't go away to college because I was afraid. I was, she was all I knew, you know, and, and even though she was one of five, she was constantly disowning her family every other week. So I didn't have anybody else but her and my brother, you know, that was, that was my only constant. I had other people here and there. So I think at that point, especially um, referring back to when, you know, my mom got thrown down the stairs and that whole thing, I think I was too young to even know. Because we're talking about, I wasn't, it was before I was eight years old when that happened. So I think I was just way too young to understand anything that was going on in my life um, up until that point. And then, um, so after that happened, um, she, you know, back in another relationship right away. And, um, w she is in a relationship with someone, another female, and it gets pretty serious. And, um, they decide to buy a house together. And now this specific person was, I would say the only, um, I guess normalcy that I had in my life. Um, she had a big family. I was close with them. We would do family vacations. Um, she was nice. She was fun. Uh, she, she wanted to, to be near us. You know, my brother and I, she, she wanted that family feeling cause she came from a big family. And so, um, it was, it was good. But by this point, I'm really noticing my mom's up and down where, um, you know, back to what you said about, you know, how I was feeling with my brother. I always had that feeling of, I was very jealous to be honest. You know, I'm a kid. I, I see my older brother has a father, not only a father, but like a full blown family, <laughs> like grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles. He has a brother on that side. Um, nieces and nephews. It was just, stepsisters, all of it. He has a huge family over there. And here's me, you know, at just with this crazy person. And um, she would always use that against me. So if I was in trouble, again, over anything, she would always um, be extra nice to my brother in front of me. So we would be just like a, a scenario, we would be at the dinner table um, and she would touch my brother's face and she would, she would just say, oh, you're my baby. I love you. I love you so much. And not even acknowledge, me, <laughs> like at all, not say one word to me, not look at me as if I weren't there. And she'd be like, you know, you know, I love you. You know, you're my, you're, you're the best. Like she, she would always, always, always do that. And, um, so she, she really, any, any weakness that she had found in me, that was where she, she really made sure to like hit me there. And so 
we move in with, you know, her girlfriend and, um, we were there for about five years. And now this is where things get crazy is that my mom winds up cheating on her girlfriend with a guy. And I know about it. So I'm about, you know, 12, 12 around this point. And I know that she's cheating and it was a guy at her job and um for some I don't like she she would just tell me these things and oh I really I really like him and I don't know if I had questioned her about it because I was a very observant kid I was um very quiet but I observed everything I knew what was going on around me but I was silent you know I didn't speak up I didn't say anything and so she's cheating on her girlfriend I know about it um at you know they her and this guy are together for a while um behind her girlfriend's back and I remember on my birthday I guess it would either my 12th or 13th birthday um she worked where she worked was about like a 10 minute drive, give or take traffic, like another five, 10 minutes, if that. And, um, she was at, she was going to take me shopping and she was supposed to be home by like five. And, you know, during the week, the mall closed at like eight. So she left work. She called me, told me she was leaving said, okay, getting ready. You know, we were going to pick up my friend. We were going to go shopping. And all of a sudden, a half hour goes by. And I call. And she's like, I'm in traffic. I'm coming. I said, okay. Another half hour goes by. I call. No answer. Another half hour. It took about, like, two hours. By the time she came home, we went to the mall, but everything was closing. So it turns out I finally call her and I get her on the phone and I say, what is going on? You work, you know, 10, 15 minutes away. You're not here. Where are you? And she says, I'm fighting with, you know, the guy that she was cheating on her girlfriend with. And, um, you know, I'm fighting with him. I'm sorry. We got into a bad fight. I'm on my way home now. And I said, okay. You know, what am I going to say? Okay, fine. So her, I have, I also forgot to say that the person she was with, the female, um, the girlfriend was a, um, officer. So, and I was very close with her and, um, she, I remember being in her office. And this was after the birthday scenario. And I remember being in her office at our house and she was kind of talking to me. And I think that she knew what was going on. Um, And she was kind of feeling me out to see if I knew. And so in a way, like, I didn't know. I was kind of being, like, um, interrogated without even knowing it. And I came out and said that my mom was with this guy. And, um, I don't know to this day if my mom knows that, but that eventually led to their breakup. And it went exactly like this. Uh, the girlfriend accused my mom. My mom admitted it. I remember my mom saying something along the lines of, and the sex is better or something like that. And um, at that point when my mom said that, her girlfriend smacked her in the face. I remember this. And, um, you know, as soon as that happened, my mom is like, oh, my God, she smacked me. Like trying, you know, like making it a huge thing and whatever. And so she um, packed our bag. And at this point, my brother, it's summer. So he's at his father's. 
So he packs the bag, like I guess an overnight bag, and goes, we leave, and we go to her friend's house. And I never, at this point, I, that's it, we left, and I never saw my mom's girlfriend again until later on when I got older. And um, I was just ripped away. Everything was very quick, as I said. I was ripped away. No goodbyes. We had it was a. We lived with her for five years, and um, we had a family. I had cousins. I had aunts, uncles on her side, and I was ripped away. There were there was no goodbye. There was no seeing them again. It was done, and we left and didn't go back. And um, I remember her going to her friend. And then the next day, she drove and drove and drove and drove about an hour east from where we live. And she got off a random exit and went to the first, uh, like, Century 21 place, I guess, um, like a realtor place, and put a down payment on a home. And next thing I know, we're living in this huge six bedroom home insanely huge um and that was it that was you know like it was we forgot about the 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 ex-girlfriend and now she's moved us an hour away um we don't know anyone it's a weird town um and now, let me just backtrack a second. So, appar- apparently, at, when I got older, I found out that the child support that my dad had owed her, he had owed her a lot of money through child support. And as the story goes, I was told that she was given, like, a back pay or, like, a retro pay. So, she got a lump sum from him because of child support. Um, and that's the money that she used to go buy this house or not buy it, but you know, uh, whatever. Yeah. Buy the house. And so this now I'm, um, 13 turning 14 and, or 12, I think 12 turning 13 and we're in this huge home and my mom is isolating. She's in her room. She's not talking to me to the point where I remember I would be saying, you know, mom, mom. And she just wouldn't answer. And at this point she's heavy drinking. She's having parties, having people over, not really caring um, about anything. And this is the point where I start to feel like, wow, no, like no one loves me. So why am I here? Like, what is the point of me being here? Um, And one day I, you know, I'm 13, so I don't really know much about like suicide or anything like that. Um, so I decide that I'm going to drink bleach and I guess in my head, I thought that that would kill me if I did that. Um, I don't even know if that's something that would kill me or if it would just like really mess me up, but I have in my head, okay, I'm going to do this. And I also forgot to state that when we moved into this big house, my grandfather moved in with us and, but he, the house was so big, like nobody saw e- each other. Um, and so I plan it out where no one's home and, um, or I thought no one was home and I get a cup of bleach and I go in the bathroom and I'll never forget. I was kind of like prepping myself in the mirror, like, okay, you got this. Like, who cares? Nobody's going to care. And no joke, this is exactly how it happened. I go to grab the cup and 
my, my grandfather knocks on the door and he says, I have to shower. I need to get in there. And I got so scared that I dumped the bleach and I just like ran out of the bathroom and I didn't do anything. And, you know, looking back now, I feel like that was some type of a higher power moment for me. Um, because what are the chances of that? And like I said, I don't know that that would have necessarily done the job, but I thought in my head that it would. And so um, that's when I start to self-harm instead. And I, um, I, burn, I would burn myself and um, I would use salt and ice and I would put salt on my skin and I would put the ice on it and I would, uh, it would, you know, it was like um, hot ice, I think, or whatever it's called. And it burns your skin. And so um, I remember a friend of mine, Karen, telling my mother, because I had confided in a friend, telling her, you know, that I did that. And her mother had told my mother. And my mom got so mad at me and was so disgusted with me that she, she was just so like, almost like in, like I embarrassed her, like, how dare you do that and embarrass me, you know? And, and then I remember one time, so, so now my mom had known that I was doing this and I was doing it on my arm. So I had to figure out other places to do it. So I would do it on my leg or I would do it on my stomach. And I remember one time me and my brother were wrestling or whatever we were doing. And my sweatshirt kind of like lifted up and he saw the mark on my stomach. And it was like, that was the first time my brother ever looked at me with pure disgust. And so, you know, never once did anyone look at it as, wow, she needs help. Like never, it was, it was always something's wrong with you. Uh, you're like, you're, you're overreacting. You're dramatic. You're, you, what's wrong? Like, you know, like you have nothing going on. What's wrong? And at this point, anytime I would get in trouble at this age, my mom would always ask me anytime I was in trouble, did anyone ever touch you? And it wouldn't, and you know, I did, I was getting in trouble with boys. I was boy crazy at this point, but even if it didn't involve boys, she would always ask me that. And I always stayed silent, but it was like, she knew something had happened. I don't know how, I don't know what made her feel that way, but she always, there was like, she, she just, I felt like she knew something because I can't even tell you how many times she asked that. Um, literally hundreds of times she asked that. And so, you know, I'm self-harming. And we're living in this new place for one year. And then my mom goes bankrupt. <laughs> and after one year, we have to move. And she... Decide. So we go from the six bedroom, huge house, huge. And we move into a two bedroom apartment. And now this apartment is two blocks away from her ex-girlfriend that she ripped us away from. So now we're two blocks away. And this is where she's constantly tell, like she's in her own world not thinking about anyone I remember one time her and my brother had gotten into a fight and she and my brother it was the first time I my brother ever got real because he was always okay with her he would do crazy things she would she would flip out and he would he was like fine he, he never reacted never you know like flipped out on her never did any of that and I always felt like, how do you not see that she's crazy? Even though I didn't do anything, I was so scared. 
I could, I would never stand up to her or, you know, at that point ever get out of line because she was just so scary. But he, he just acted as if she were normal, or at least that's how I took it. I took it as he acted as if she were normal. And it started to really create this um, thing within me where I felt like I was the freaky one. I was always made out, you know, when I would act up or, or do something, I, it was always, look at what you're doing to us. Don't you see what you're doing? She always, her favorite line was, when you have a daughter, you're going to see. You're going to see what, what you, you're going to regret how um, you acted when you get a daughter. You're going to regret all of this stuff that you did when you have kids. You're going to see. She always, always said that. And um, so we moved from this huge house, and now we're two blocks away from where we lived a year prior, you know. And we're in a two-bedroom apartment, the three of us. And her and my brother had gotten into this fight, and I will never forget exact verbatim my brother said, He said two things that really always stuck with me. He said, it's bitches like you that make me want to kill myself. And then he looked at me and he said, always remember, no matter what, she will always put anybody she's with over us. Don't ever forget that. And, and he walked out and, um, you know, he left for a day or two and then he came back. And again, we act like it doesn't happen. So how old, um, are, how old are you there mm-hmm. and how old is your brother there? I am uh, 13, going on 14, because it was my, um, or was I, I was either, I was in ninth grade. So I have like, um, I'm the oldest in my class, as, as I would say, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I was either, I think I was actually four, and my brother was four years older than me. So this so is he, so this is the first moment he, where you see your brother as maybe yeah. a real person in the sense of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he mm-hmm. does know what's going on. He's just been mm-hmm. too afraid. Did you guys have a conversation ever about that? Or like, as you just said, no. it was all swept under the rug as if it, nothing ever happened. Yeah, nothing happened. We didn't talk about it. Um, uh, I remember when he left, she had taken his phone because it was under her plan. And he left. He was driving already, so he had a car. He took this garbage bag, and he filled all of his stuff with in this garbage bag, you know, his clothes, and he left. And he didn't have the phone. And, um, like... 30 minutes later, my mom is crying, um, you know, trying to call all of his friends, see where he is. And then I don't know what happened, but like two days later, he winds up coming back and, you know, they're fine. And now it's like, it never happened. So I saw like a little glimpse of him being real in the sense of like calling her out on what she has done. But then it like went away. It was as if it never happened. And um, this specific year is when I'm really crying out for attention. And I'm really just crying out in, in such bad ways. Um, you know, I experiment with drugs, a lot of them. Um, I am, you know, I, I lose my virginity. And then... You know, it just, I, I, I wanted love in any way I can get it from whoever I could get it. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted to feel like somebody cared or somebody loved me. And, you know, I was dating, not dating, but talking to someone that was my brother's age. And now I'm 14 and I'm talking to an 18 year old and my brother knows that this is happening. 
And so, again, I'm painted out to be this horrible person because now I'm, you know, having sex or talking to older boys or whatever. And it's, look at what you're doing. I can't, you're disgusting. You're, you're a whore. You're this, you're that. And um, I believed it. Like, I truly believed that I was this fucked up person, you know? And I didn't under, like, I, I knew I was doing bad things. So it, like, every, she would go to the family and then she would say, oh, you know, look at what my daughter is doing. She's, she's, you know, sleeping with guys or she's fucking the older guys or she um, came home drunk or whatever. And everyone believed it, which it was true. I was doing those things, but she never once admitted anything that she did. I don't think she was even able to process or, or, even like take ownership of what she was doing. Like, I don't think she thinks that she did anything. So in a way, so in a way she was broadcasting your business to everyone while not uh, talking about her business. So no one would know what she'd Mm -hmm. be doing, but you were painted out as Mm -hmm. this wild thing when in fact, you know, yeah, you might've been uh, a wild, but Mm -hmm. she was uh, the predecessor and, you know, the king of being wild before Mm -hmm. uh, that happened. And now she's just, Mm -hmm. painting you out here to be the bad guy as was she a big Mm -hmm. gossiper in that sense oh yeah oh yeah she gossip she would gossip home like to us about her family members and then but it was always anything i did everyone had to know everyone so and it was it was it was crazy because it wasn't even like she was close with her family, but she wanted them and needed them to know what was happening to her. You know, like my daughter's crazy and she's doing all these bad things. She's out of control. I can't I can't control her. It was a very like poor me. I'm the victim. Mm-hmm. My daughter's out of control. I don't know what to do. You know. And I remember I had run away and again, you know, giving, adding more fuel to the fire that the pic or adding more, whatever to the picture she's painting. I run away and I go away for about a week, I would say. And, um, she, I, I, she finds me. I, don't remember I think a friend I had told a friend where I was and that friend told my mom and um I went away I just you know I partied whatever I came now my friend had told her that I was doing drugs um and you know when when I say I was doing drugs I wasn't addicted I was at that point at such a low point that I was just I was young too. I was just experimenting. You know, I was with the wrong crowd. They were doing drugs and, and I was like, sure, why not? F it. You know, I'm going to do it too. And so she finds me. And when she finds me, she takes me straight to the hospital to get drug tested because she wants to know what I'm on. And I really don't know how, how this happened. Because I I did ecstasy and I did um, ketamine. I tried it. And I don't know how it wasn't in my system. Like, I don't know if that's something that leaves your system quickly or or whatever. But the only thing that showed up was marijuana. Which I, because at that point, as we're waiting for the results, I'm like, this lady's going to kill me when she sees what I did. And I remember being in the hospital, we're waiting, and I guess the the doctor was kind of, you know, giving me like a little checkup. And they see the marks on my arms from my self-harm. And they asked me what that was, and I kind of, you know, pulled my shirt down, and I said nothing. And then 
they go outside and talk. And when my mom comes back in, she says, they want to keep you here, but I'm not going to do that. So you're lucky that I'm not going to make them keep you here because I should, you know, as if I guess they wanted me to stay for an evaluation in the psych ward. And I didn't because, but this is all what's said. I don't know if that conversation even really happened. I would assume it did because they did see marks on my arm, but I don't know. So that's what she said. She made it seem like you're lucky for me because I really should leave you here, but I'm not gonna. So, okay. So then after I run away, I'm home and about now at this point, I have not seen or really talked to my father in a couple of years. And so my father now lives in a different country. <laughs> so um, she one day tells me, oh, you're going to go visit your dad. And it's summer. It's actually 4th of July. And um, we're out to dinner and she tells me. And now I'm kind of excited because, okay, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm older. I'm like 14, 15. I'm going to go to, you know, he lives in a tropical country. So I'm going to go somewhere nice, you know, and this is great. As soon as I land with my father, because again, this was like a quick, he tells me, and then the next day I'm on a plane. And so as soon as I get there, she pretty much tells me that I'm staying there indefinitely and that she doesn't know when or if I'm coming home. I'm out of control and she, she can't handle it anymore. So she essentially sends me to go live with a stranger because my father was not a factor in my life. And my father was a raging alcoholic who paid no mind to me. He abused the girlfriend that he was living with. Um, And at this point, I am filled with rage. Even before my mom had sent me away, I'm filled with rage. I have a lot of built up emotions that I don't know what to do about them. And so now this is like my fourth move in like two years. And so now I'm in this country. I don't really speak the language. Are you supposed to go to school um, there? Yeah, I'm supposed to go to school there. Okay. Um, I'm, I understood the language I did not really speak it well um and now I'm there and at in this country you know the drinking age is like I don't even know 13 and up it's not like where I am or it's 21 and over it wasn't like that and so you know my father was out doing whatever he was doing I was left home a lot alone not and sometimes his girlfriend would be there but she was not that much older than she was like in her 20s right so she was young and um I was drinking a lot I was drinking a lot at his house I remember um one time I was drunk and I actually well tipsy maybe and I I called my father out on the whole cheating thing and um, all of that. You know, you were never in my life. You cheated. And he kind of looked at me like, what? What are you talking about? And I was like, I know what you did. Like, I know what happened. And then he kind of disregarded it. And I remember I wrote him a letter. And I really um, bared my heart into this letter. And I kind of told him, like, I don't care what happened. I just want a father. And my entire life, I was always worried about who's going to walk me down the aisle at my wedding. You know, who do I, I have no one. My mom is in, um, you know, relationships with females. So it's not even like I have a stepfather or anything like that. Like I, I was always just worried about that. Like I just, I wanted to feel normal. 
I wanted a father, a mother. I just wanted to, to feel and I guess appear normal. Um, because not only did I not have my father, but my mom was gay and that's not, you know, at that time, it wasn't something that you saw a lot. You didn't like, I didn't know any friends at that age until I got older, whose parents were, were gay or anything like that. I didn't, there was none of that, that I knew of. Um, and so I just wanted him to be a dad. I just wanted that. And he disregarded it. He said nothing about it. Um, he, it was as if I didn't write the letter, actually. And um, I remember, so then I, I started school there. And um, I wasn't in school for long because my father had refused to buy me sneakers for the school. You know, it was like a uniform and I needed sneakers and he wouldn't buy me them. He, he wanted my mom to overnight a pair of sneakers. And now at this point, I think I had been in the school for um, a couple of weeks, I think. And um, I was wearing just dress I needed sneakers for like gym class. And she got mad at him and was like, you know, why, why? can't you just buy her sneakers? I have the FedEx from, you know, a different country sneakers. Um, so that was the thing. And then at some point in the conversation, um, I was talking to my mom and my father had called me. I don't remember why, but he, he called me a piece of shit and my mom heard it. And she, I remember her saying, put him on the phone. And I said, okay. And then he had said, I wasn't saying that about her. I was talking about my car, but he wasn't because nobody was talking about his car. And um, I had gotten back on the phone and she said, you're coming home. I said, okay, you know, no questions. And a couple of days later, now I'm on a flight back home to where she is. So what do you think about that, that now your mom here is standing up for you uh, when, it, when before she was not? It was very confusing. I didn't understand it because, and I think at that point it was almost like, okay, maybe, maybe she does love me. You know, maybe, maybe it is all in my head and maybe it is just me. And, you know, I don't know. I think there were so many things that came up. Like for a really long time, I, I, I really did think it was me and not her. And not because my brother was okay with her. Um, it was just, it seems like it was just me. Though she had problems with her family and stuff, it always seemed like it was just me having the issues, you know. And so when I came back home, now when I leave the airport to come back home, that is the last time. I hear, see, or speak to my father. Never hear, speak to him again. And as soon as I get home, I will never forget this. My mom said to me, now you know what parent loves you. Just like that. Now you know what parent loves you. And that was such, like, a mind fuck <laughs> to me um, because I remember thinking, did you send me there so that I could experience that? Like, I didn't understand the logic. Like was, was the logic that you were going to send me to someone that you knew wanted nothing to do with me just so that it was like some type of lesson to her, you know, like, well, now you know that, I am the, the the one that loves you and he doesn't, you know, it, it was very weird, but I'll never forget those words. And now when I moved back, she's now living with someone else, another female who she winds up marrying. Um, and 
we're in a new home. So I come back, I left from the two bedroom apartment and I come back not long later because it was July and I came back in October. So I come back to a new home, a new town, um, you know, school had already started. So I'm a month late going into school as the new kid. Um, and it's high school. So it's, um, it was a lot for me. And, um, at this point, my, I think I start to see really around like this point that something's really not right with her, even though I, I, I think I subconsciously already knew, but now I really know that something's not right. And she's really drinking a lot. And she's um, just very hateful and rude to everyone. Um, the person that she was married to was very heavy. And my mom would constantly, she would drink and she would point that out. And she would say, like, I remember one day she got really drunk and she came home and she she locked she came in my room and locked herself in my room and her wife at the time was saying you know come out of the room come upstairs and and talk to me and my mom was just yelling you're you're disgusting you're a fat fuck i want nothing to do with you um i'm turned off by you just like through the door and this is like a wednesday night <laughs> like not you know, just like a regular weekday night and she's drunk and she throws herself in my room. And it was just like, now this is, this was her pattern. She would just get drunk and be really hateful. And, um, I was constantly me and actually her wife were constantly the target. Um, I would say I was more the target um, of her rage and her craziness. Um, you know, she, she would, I remember too, she would always ask, she always needed to to feel like we loved her. So she would always ask, um, well, she wouldn't ask. She would say, I feel like you don't, you don't love me. Do you love me? Are you sure you love me? Um, like, and then I would, I would say, yeah, mom, I love you. But it, I knew it was weird. Like I wasn't, it wasn't, I knew it was not normal. And it would be about anything. Um, if, if my brother said that he liked my aunt's cooking, she would say, oh, but I cook better, right? And she was always jealous of everyone, always. Um, you know, my brother had a stepmom and she would always say, oh, but I'm prettier, right? aren't I prettier? And, and she would say things like all the time, all the time. And so at this point, when we're living here um, in this new house with her wife now, there, now her wife was not a family oriented person and her wife, they liked to travel a lot. Um, they would go wherever, you know, statewide, but, they would just go. And, you know, at this point I was older. My brother was in his twenties. I'm, you know, 17 around there. And, um, they go for, for, you know, weekends or a week or whatever. And, um, I remember specifically and around this time, I, I would get in a lot of trouble at school, you know, like I would cut class or I, um, I was late, so I had, like, a lot of tensions. And when she would ask, out of fear, I would just lie. I lied all the time um, because you couldn't tell her the truth. And she she was just, like, oh, I can't even describe the fear that I had. And it's funny because I look at, I, I, you know, as I'm older and I think back and I'm, like, wow, like, today I, I don't have any fear of her. You know, I... I don't have that, but I was so scared as a child of her, even as a teenager, she was just scary. And, um, I remember my senior prom, which I feel like every, 
girl is like excited about that or at least most girls are very excited about their senior prom and um I remember you know getting excited and saying oh you know like we have to go get my dress and and she was like oh yeah when when is your senior prom and I told her the date and she said oh we we have um tickets to go somewhere and and I was like, okay, but it's my senior prom. Like I, you know, that's a big thing in, in my high school years and, and stuff. And um, she didn't care. She left and, and went to, on vacation. Um, I, I got dressed. I had my friend do my makeup. Uh, my brother came home from like his break at work and took like two pictures of, uh, she took two pictures of us, like, you know, with our date. And at this point, I'm also in a relationship with my high school boyfriend, who's super toxic. And um, he, he would, le- he, he would, like, ditch me to go hang out with um, his friends and do, like, drugs all night and then go missing and wouldn't talk to me and somehow it would be my fault. Like I either, I called him too much or I pissed him off in some way that made him not want to talk to me or, or, you know, it was always my fault no matter. So, so no matter what relationship we're talking, I was always at fault and I was conditioned to believe that there was something wrong with me. You know, it's not everyone else. It has to be me because you know, what's going on here. There's so many different dynamic that you know I don't even know what's going on and um that was just a really toxic relationship he cheated he he was violent not not like physical he didn't hit me but like I remember one time he I got him upset and he had this um like thing of water like a container of water and he took it and he like Blashed it in my face when I wasn't like expecting it. It was just bad, just bad all around. And um, so my mom misses my prom, and um, you know she's drinking. She's definitely crazier, showing like she's now like now I'm just noticing a lot of the craziness. Um, the, there's a lot more favoritism because like I said, I was getting into trouble at school, whether it was like failing a test or cutting class or whatever, the punishment would be so extreme and it would be, my cell phone was taken away. All the phones in the house were taken away. The computer, like every, like just so isolated. That was my punishments. My whole life were very isolating and in a way, um, it made, it was like comfortable for me to isolate. That's what I do now as an adult. You know, I, when, when I'm struggling, I, I isolate and I'm aware of it now. So obviously I try not to do that, but it definitely like, she always wanted to keep me isolated. I couldn't go out. I couldn't have friends over. Um, you know, obviously, when I wasn't punished, I was allowed out, but the curfew was very, like, early. Um, and, like, I was just always in trouble. I was more I was more punished than I wasn't, always. And so um, that pretty much stays the same up until I leave at 18 when I um, graduate high school. And I, you know, at this point, I'm dating someone... And he's, you know, moved out and he was my age. So we were the same age. We started dating. And I, at that point, would just do anything to get the hell away from my mom. Um, And this really is where the story kind of starts because um, things just take a really big turn for the worse. Um. So I'm, you know, I moved out and then me and this guy didn't last long. And so I go and I stay with friends and, um, 
you know, me and him break up, I go stay with friends. And at this point, now this is where it gets kind of crazy. So I'm going to try to explain this in the best way I can. So when we lived with my mom's first girlfriend um, for five years, across the street, our neighbor is my, that was my, where my husband now lives, lives. So my husband was my neighbor across the street, but he was my brother's age. So we didn't deal with each other when I was younger and lived across the street from him. But any time I would like get locked out of my house and my mom wasn't home, I would go to his house and his mom would watch me until my mom came home. So I knew them. I was familiar with them. So now it's 2009. I graduate high school. I'm out of the house. I'm at my friend's house, you know, staying there. And I'm a disaster. You know, I'm drinking heavily at this point. Um, I'm a mess. My life is a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a tortured soul, really. And um, my husband and I, we get reacquainted through Facebook. And we talk and we hit it off. And it was Halloween 2009. We hang out. And that was it. From then on, we, we started dating. And, um, but my ex-boyfriend, who I had, was living with for a little bit and then left, um, he went to my mom and told my – now, my mom doesn't really know him. But he goes to my mom and he tells my mom – that I, he made up this story that I was dating like a drug dealer or something. And she, she believed him. It, it was no, there were no questions. There was no, um, is this really the truth? There, it was nothing like that. And I remember she called me one day and she was like, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, that's fine. So we talked. I, I meet up with her and she asked me for the house key. And she says, I know that your boyfriend is, so now I'm dating, you know, my husband at this point. And um, I know he's a drug dealer. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Where did you even get this information? You know, I, I know. And you're disowned. That's it. It's done. Don't ever talk to me again. Don't ever speak to me again. You're, you're not allowed at the house. You're, you're disowned. I'm disowned. So first time those words come out, I'm 18. And again, I'm a mess at this point in my life already. So now you throw, it was just a lot of, okay, you know, now I was like, look at what you did. You're, you're not who I wanted. You're going to see when you have kids, um, you're going to, Again, you're going to regret this. Um, at least I have your brother. There's a lot of that going on. And again, I'm fearful of her, so I'm just yesing her to death. Okay, okay, okay. And I go about my way. And now me and my husband, we move kind of fast. So we, we start dating, and about a year later, we move into our first apartment. And then about a year after that, we get engaged and I find out I'm pregnant. And at this point, my mom and I are like back and forth. Like at some point in the time that I got pregnant and she disowned, like she disowned me and I got pregnant, we started talking again. And at some point in there, she had spitefully we had gotten into an argument and she spitefully took me off of her health insurance and I didn't really care to be honest because you know at that point I'm you know 19 20 I don't really care about health insurance <laughs> like it doesn't matter to me I wasn't someone who like regularly went to the doctor so I didn't care about that but I wind up getting pregnant and now I have no insurance so that's the problem so she gets me on insurance 
um, not heard. She gets me on, uh, you know, like the government assisted uh, insurance and she does everything for me. She tells me she's going to fix this. Um, she's going to get me on insurance. I'm going to be fine. Um, and, you know, explains to me that she doesn't want to put me on her insurance because she, um, she would have to pay like the back pay of the year. And so that was too much money. So it's just easier to do this. And I said, okay, sure, whatever. Um, you know, there were some things that I guess she had put down, like, you know, our apartment at the time was, um, like an illegal apartment. So the, the homeowner was just like renting it to us, but it wasn't like a legal apartment. So we couldn't like get our mail there or anything like that. And so my mom was also a notary. So she was able to just fill out any paperwork and then notarize it. So that is what she did for me. She, she put me on this insurance. She filled it out. Um, she notarized it. And I'm just following her lead. You know, I'm whatever. You're my mom. You're, you're helping me. You, I'm, th- I'm thinking at this point that she's helping me because she regrets what she did, you know, taking me off of the insurance. So now she's kind of making up for that. She's helping me get on insurance. And so I'm kind of looking at it as, okay, like, even though she did what she did, she's helping. And so I get pregnant. I have my daughter. Um, and, you know, she gives me, oh, so at this point, my husband's father had given me one of his cars. He had like a, a car that had like a lot of mileage on it, but he, he kept it insured because um, he would use it for parking in front of his house, whatever. That's a whole other thing. But he had this car and he gave it to me. I needed a car. I didn't have one. And so my mom had just paid off her car and I'm pregnant. I didn't have my daughter at this time. So I'm preg- I'm like almost getting ready to have a baby. And she tells me, you could have my car. It's paid off. It had like no mile- mileage. Um, and she tells me that I can have it. So the car that I had from my, you know, husband, father, I had sold it to my brother's friend for like nothing, a couple of hundred dollars. He wanted the car, gave it to him. My mom gave me her car. She didn't give me the title. I don't know why. I don't know if that was like on purpose. Um, but she didn't give it to me. And so I had the car. And so technically it was still under her name. And, um, you know, months go by. I have, I have my, my daughter. And at this point, my mom is heavily abusing her Xana prescription. And um, she, she, I remember, so my in-laws live, near where me and my husband were living at, at that point. And my mom lived further away. So, I, so my mom lived probably, uh, you know, 30 minutes away where my husband's parents only live 10 minutes away. So it, we were going, if, if my daughter was going to sleep out, she always would sleep out at my husband's parents' house because they were closer. And I really just never trusted my mother. So, um, especially at this point, she's abusing prescription drugs and, and I know it, she's not admitting that she's doing it, but everyone knows it. And, um, one, it was my birthday weekend and I was getting my nails done. I'll never forget. And I am turning 22. So I, you know, have my daughter. I couldn't celebrate my 21st birthday because I found out I was pregnant with her right before then. And so 22, I'm getting ready to celebrate, and my mom calls me. And prior to this phone call, she she had a couple of accidents, like car accidents. Um, she totaled, like, brand-new cars, a brand-new car because she was high on Xanax while 
um, she was driving. And um, just like a lot of crazy things. So she's full into uh, an addiction to Xanax. And she calls me, and I'm with my friend, my best friend. She calls me, and she says, oh, you know, what are you doing this weekend for your birthday? And I say, I'm going out. Um, you know, we're, we're having, we're going to go out with friends, whatever. She says, oh, well, where's your daughter staying? And I say, you know, with my husband's parents. And she lost it. She... She said, well, she didn't lose it at that point. So she said, well, why can't she stay with me? And I said, because you're further away. I was trying to just be nice about it. I was like, no, you're further away. It just makes sense. God forbid something happens to her. I can get to my husband's parents' house much quicker than I can get to yours. And my daughter was, wasn't even a year old. She was like eight months. And, um, you know, at that point, like my mom, I was the last kid she ever dealt with, you know, like she, she hasn't changed diaper in 20 something years. At this point, my husband's mother was a full-time babysitter for our niece. So he was familiar with, with babies again. And so I was just more comfortable with her watching my daughter rather than my mom. And at some point in the conversation, I kind of lost it. And I said, mom, you're, you're taking Xanax. Like you, you take a lot of Xanax. This is my child. It's not like my dog, <laughs> you know, like I can't trust the fact that you're going to be able to watch her. And she lost it. She lost it. And she gave me an ultimatum and said, if you do not bring your daughter here for me to walk, I'm going to come and take that car back. Like she knew, I guess she like realized like, or she knew all along that she never gave me the title. So, um, you know, long story short, she, she, I was petrified. She was threatening. She was saying that she was going to call the court and she was going to get like, she had right. Oh, she would always say she had rights as a grandparent and that she was going to call the court and get her right. And I was petrified that, that she was like, right. I believed her. I was, I was so scared that she was going to get her grips on my daughter, you know? And, um, I remember being in panic mode that weekend because she said, you have until you have, if you do not come drop her off, I am coming and I'm going to get that car. And in my head, I think I, I was, I was more thinking like, there's no way. Cause like, I knew that she didn't like me, but like, I don't know. I always just gave the benefit of the doubt. Like, no, there's no way she's going to go that far. Like she's gone far. She said mean things and, and acted like she hated me, but there's no way she's going to do that. Because she knew, like, I sold my car or to my brother's friend. She gives me a car, and, and now you're threatening to take it away. And mind you, it's like dead set winter. We have one car that's like a piece of crap car that my husband was driving. And then I had the good car for my daughter and stuff. And she came and she took that car. And she told me to leave the keys in the car and that she was going to come and take it. And she came and took it. And it was, uh, like five days after my birthday. That was the weekend that we were actually, it was the day before we were going to go out and, um, she came and she took it. And, um, that was, that was like the first to me at that point, that was like the first devastating thing that she ever did was take that car back because now I'm you know my husband worked I had no car I couldn't do anything um his mom would have to come pick me up and take me to the store or you know we couldn't afford a car we couldn't we were we were young we moved fast you know and um so I I stopped talking to her I went no contact for a little bit um when that happened and um 
she my bro so my brother plays a part in this because any time I would stop talking to my mother, my brother would kind of swoop in and um get us to talk again. So he would he would say, you know, she's really sorry. And and it never came from her. It would always come from him. Um, she's really sorry. He, uh, you know, whatever. It, like he would just make me. I I felt bad. I would I would feel bad, and I was always fearful that if I didn't talk to my mom, that my brother wouldn't talk to me anymore. And for some reason, I I couldn't handle that thought, and so I I you know, took a lot of things off the strength of I didn't want to lose my brother. I didn't even care about losing my mom. It was him that I cared about losing. And, um, you know, I would eventually go back and talk to her. And um, uh, there was one instance where we weren't talking, but then she had told me. And I was away with um, my husband and my best friend and her, at the time, boyfriend. And I don't remember exactly what the conversation was, but she was apologizing. She, she, I don't really remember exactly, but I remember I had a couple of drinks in me, and I said, your apology doesn't mean anything to me. And I remember saying to her, you hurt me more than dad ever could, because I was always hurt that my dad wasn't in my life. I said, you hurt me more because you were in my life and you, you did these things to me, but he at least like just left, you know, like he, he didn't stay and abuse me. He just left. So I remember saying that and I hung up the phone on her and I said, you know, I want, I don't want anything to do with you. I had like that liquid courage, you know, and hang up and I go back to the table and you know, where my friend and everyone's sitting and I just look at them and I say, that lady is going to kill herself. I knew it. Like I, it would mind you, she's never that I knew of at that point tried to suicide. She was just a drinker and did her pills. And so it was two days later that I wake up to text messages from my brother and phone calls that I had missed. Um, saying 911 emergency, and I knew it. Like, I just knew. And um, at this point, my brother is still living with my mom. I've been out since I'm 18. Um, I have a daughter. You know, I'm engaged. I'm I'm trying to, to live an as normal life as I can. And, you know, I get hit with, she tried committing suicide. And um, that was the first of many attempts but it was the first one that we had ever dealt with. So it was really scary. I, I kind of dropped all of the drama that we were going through and I rushed to the hospital and, you know, um, there were suicide letters, suicide notes. Uh, I can't even remember what it said. Um, you know, I, I remember it being something along the lines of, I, I know I wasn't a good mother and, and this kind of thing, whatever. And um, it was just a really hard feeling. You know, I, I was very confused because I knew I felt some way about her. <laughs> but then at the same time, it was like, oh, my God, but it's still my mom. You know, like, oh, my God, she tried to kill herself. Like, nothing else means anything because it's my mom and she tried to kill herself. And so, again, I, I did. I had this very strange and um, weird attachment to her in a sense. And um, I will never forget she, you know, she had to stay in the hospital for a week, I think, or two, I don't know. And she comes out and (laughs) I'm with my husband and we're going, we were pulling through like a fast food place and she was in the back seat and she said word for word I did what I had to do to get my daughter back in front of my husband and we both kind of looked at each other 
like, did she really just say what we think she just said? And, you know, we didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. But I was, I remember feeling so angry because I knew, like, wow, did, like, now I'm thinking, wait, did you, was that all just, like, on purpose so that I can, you know, uh, come talk to you again or whatever? It was just, like, a very, like, wait, what? Like, unbelievable. All of it is, like, so unbelievable. So that's the first time that she tries committing suicide. And again, we're still, she's still very heavy in doing her Xanax. Um, she, she would make a fool out of herself and, and be high and call my mother-in-law as she was high. And it was, oh my God, it was so crazy. And I remember one time she, she called me and asked me if I could take her to go to her psychiatrist. And I said, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, sure, I can lecture her the whole way about like this Xanax use and, and try to talk some sense into her. Cause you know, at this point, I don't know anything about addiction like that. And I don't know that, you know, I'm not in control, which I learned later on in the program that I'm in. But um, I remember talking to her the whole way, telling her like, you need to stop, you need to, stop taking Xanax um, just because you get it from your doctor doesn't mean it's not like a regular drug. You buy it on the street. It's, you know, whatever. And she's yesing me to death, yesing me to death. She goes to her psychiatrist, comes out with a prescription. She's now telling me that she doesn't know where the pharmacies are, where she lives. So we need to go to a pharmacy to fill her prescription. So we do. And as soon as she gets in the car, she pops Susanna. And I was so mad, flipping out. And she just doesn't care, you know, just n- didn't care. Nothing phased her ever. And um, so take the car. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, what happens next. So um, he, let's see. Um, we said, let's say, so that's just how it was always like, it was always, um, very, she was very manipulating. So then after the first time she commits suicide, now, anytime I get mad at her or cause now I'm older and now I'm like, I'm kind of finding my voice because now I live on my own. I'm, you know, independent or as independent as I, I can be at that point. And um, I'm raising my daughter. And she, you know, it was just always on and off. And her never messed well. And so fast forward to I find out I'm pregnant with my, sec- with my second. And I call her. And the weirdest thing happened. Um, I, I, well, I found out I was having a boy and I remember calling her and saying, I'm having a boy. And she started crying <laughs> like hysterically, like, Oh my God, a grand, like, and she was always, I didn't mention this, but she was always like obsessed with my brother. Like, and, and a lot of it was to make me jealous, but then I don't know. There was this weird obsession. Like she would post on Facebook about him and, oh, my son. Like, oh, it was just odd. It was really, really weird. And um, she, it was just so weird. And so she finds out I'm having a son and she is over the moon, but like in an abnormal way. She's hysterical crying. She's so excited. She was never like that when I told her I was having a girl, by the way. She didn't, she was like excited, but like no tears, no, nothing like that. So she finds that I'm having a boy and she's over the moon excited. And this is where, so now I had my son in 2016. And so you know, we had an on and off relationship, my mother and I, and, um, she tells me now I had 
student loan, and she paid off all of all or some of my my brother's student loans, whatever it was. I know that she helped him with his, and with me, she didn't help me with mine. So one day she called and she tells me, "Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay off your student loans with my taxes. I'm just gonna pay them off for you." So that you don't have to worry about that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, that's great. You know, and again, trusting kind of just, again, accepting any type of love I'm, I can get from, from anyone. And, um, she calls me the next day and tells me that she's not doing it. And then she accuses, she accused me of, I don't, I didn't really even understand what she accused me of. It was something along the lines of like, I lied to her about how much my loan was or like she made it seem like I devised the plan for her to pay my loan. And it really didn't like, it so did not happen that way. Like it was out of nowhere that she said, I'm going to pay your loan. And I, I was like, okay, great. And then the next day it was, I'm not. And you're, you manipulated me into wanting to even pay your loan. And at this point, I'm pregnant. I'm so over her. Like, I'm just over the craziness, the, the verbal abuse, all of it. I'm over it. And I just tell her, I'm done. I can't do this anymore with you. you you've done this my entire life. Um, I'm done. You know, I'm trying to now set a boundary and just say, just, I'm not accepting this anymore. And she did not like that. At this point, my brother is engaged and he's going to have a engagement party. And my mom calls my brother and says, you're, I'm not coming. If, if, if she's going, I'm not going. And um, she always did that. She always, always did that. And so... I wind up telling my brother that I can't go. And that was really hard for me because again, I think I had like a, a I was codependent on my brother in a way I, I feel. And um, I never wanted to disappoint him. And so that was like really hard for me to not go to his engagement party, but I was pregnant and I knew that she, um, I couldn't be near her. And at this point, when I had, we kind of stopped talking, she had sent my mother-in-law a letter about, and in the letter, she writes that I'm a liar. I'm a whore. I'm an embarrassment to the family. She always likes to say that I'm just like my father. That was a biggie. I'm just, you're just like your father. You're a liar. You're a true and she would say our last name. You're a true that. Well, my father's last name. And um, how I've always given her, um, I've always given her a hard time. She actually wrote in the letter that I abused her. <laughs> she actually wrote those words that I'm like, she's my victim. And that um, a whole bunch. She, she had wrote in there that I lie about everything that um, just a whole like craziness. And she, it was hand, it was handwritten to my mother-in-law um, pages and pages of just, you know, talking really bad about me bad. And so um, that was heartbreaking, you know, cause and embarrassing because why would you even do that? You know, um, and, you know, you better watch out because she, she's good at lying and she's good at this, but you're going to see the real her. And did you know that she, she slept around with everyone, like completely just like saying everything about. Me. And my mother-in-law and I are very, very close. And my mom knew this. We, we hit it off. Um, you know, we knew each other. We, we had a lot of similarities. She, she dealt with, you know, her son, her other two sons being narcissistic and having addiction issues. And so we hit it off and, and we're just best friends. 
honestly. It's a very um, different type of mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship. I look at her as my best friend, not really as my mother-in-law. And so uh, my mom was always jealous of that uh, from day one. And my mom had this thing where it was like she didn't want me, but nobody else could have me either. And when she saw that I had this motherly kind of relationship with my mother-in-law, <laughs> she hated it and she, she wanted to ruin it. And But little did she know at that point when she had sent the letter, my mother-in-law pretty much knew everything about me. Like I was very open and honest with her because she was like the first person I, I really trusted to be that way. You know, she had her own things that she dealt with that were similar to what I dealt with. And so it was easy to talk to her about it and, and kind of be open. So thank God it didn't, you know, ruin the, the relationship or anything like that because she had known. And um, so my mom wrote that letter and, you know, I sent it to my brother. He says nothing. There was never any um, sticking up for me. There was never... Just it, it, my brother, my brother liked to put us in a category together. You know, he would say, "You two are crazy." Um, he would often make comments like that and, and put us in the same category. And I, I never understood why because she was, she it it was sick. Like she was sick. She was a sick human being, and um, he had to have known that. And again, it, 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 all of that, it continued to eat away at me and, and make me think like, am I the crazy one? Like I often thought I was, was the one with the mental issues or I was the one who was narcissistic or I, I thought it was me. It was very confusing because I'm seeing something for what it is, but nobody else is saying that they're seeing it too. No one. No one is admitting it. No one is acting like it. It was, it was just very, very hard. And it was very lonely. Um, I, did, I did all of that like on my own. I had to deal with these emotions and, and deal with her and, and the dynamic of my brother not really getting involved or, or sticking up. Like He always would just make it seem like, oh, here they go again. You know, it's, it's the both of them. It was never, why are you treating your daughter this way? Why are you doing this? And so um, we, you know, so she gets the first letter. And um, my, I tell my mother-in-law that I would feel really comfortable if she just like, you know, deleted my mom off of Facebook and kind of, kind of go no contact as well. They were never friends or anything like that. Um, so it wasn't like a big deal. So my mother-in-law respected my wishes and she did that. And then my mom got really mad and she wrote another letter. But the thing is, I didn't know about this letter. I was really pregnant and my mother-in-law decided to keep this letter from me because I was pregnant. And I believe that she did it with best intentions. I think it was a really messed up situation that she was put in the middle of she didn't know what to do and she knew that at this point you know she knows how badly my mother affects me she knows number one the letter was not a letter that a nine-month pregnant woman should be reading anyway because it's all just horrible things about me and how she feels about me and all of that so she gets the second letter and not too long after so right before I'm going to give birth to my son my I go to my brother's house and my brother um says oh I got this for you it was like a card in the mail and she um sent me a card and apologized in the card and she said I'm sorry for the two letters that I sent and at at this point I only knew about one so now I remember getting upset because I'm like, 
what do you mean two? I only got one. And I'm asking my husband and I'm, you know, telling him if you're, if you're hiding something from me, I'm going to be really mad and pissed off and you better not be like, I need to know everything. And I told my mother-in-law that too. I remember walking into her house and I said, I'm just letting everyone know that if there is a letter and someone is hiding it from me, I'm really not going to be okay with that. And everyone swore up and down that there was no letter. Um, They didn't know what I was talking about. And then I figured, well, you know, my mom's crazy. So it was a four page letter. Maybe she just got it mixed up and thought she sent two. So I let it go. I have my son at this point too, back to the health insurance. Any time it needed to be renewed, she would notarize it for me and renew it. And, um, you know, she would handle that for me. And so I have my son and I'm planning to now, you know, uh, just do the right thing, not be on insurance, you know, go on my husband's insurance now. And um, it's, I don't know, it's, um, he, my, my brother winds up sending my mother a picture of my son. I don't know this, but she does. I mean, he does. And um, on the picture, it had my maiden name. And so I guess she put two and two together and figured, why does it say her maiden name? She must be on insurance, whatever it was. She she figured something out. And um, she stored that in her brain for about a year and a half. And, you know, we don't talk for that year and a half, but now my brother's getting married. And I'm his only sister, so of course I'm in the wedding, and she's his mother, she's going, and this is the first time now that I have to see her in, I don't know, two two years around there. Um, and so I, you know, go to the wedding, I'm heavily drinking because my anxiety is out, like, outrageous. I don't want anything to do with it. She just, I, it wasn't good. So I was drinking a lot and my husband goes out to go smoke and she zeroes in on me. And out of respect for my brother, I say, now's not the time. Um, you know, she's telling me, oh, I think like it's time. We need to talk. It's been too long. I'm sorry. I'm reading, she even told me she was reading parenting books. And mind you, I'm like 20, I don't know, five or something. And she's reading parenting books and she's getting better. She's in therapy. She knows what she did and blah, blah, blah. And I just said, you know, now it's not the time and place. It's your son's wedding. Enjoy it. Um, you can give me a call, you know, when I, like tomorrow or whatever. I said, you can give me a call and we can talk. And in all honesty, I thought she was blocked from my phone. I, I don't even know how she wasn't because I definitely blocked her. Somehow she made it through and she called me. And um, she called me, I think, the next day. But the day of the wedding, the night of the wedding, I come home and I am, I, I honestly might have had alcohol poisoning that night. Like it was, that, that was how bad I was. And my mother-in-law was at my house watching my kids. So when we came home, she saw me in that condition. Like I had, I had, it was just a bad night. Like I had thrown up in the car. Like it was just, I was a mess at me. And so um, the next day, my mother-in-law decides to tell me about the second letter. And... I understood. I understood why she didn't give it to me, but I did read it and it was really upsetting. Um, it was horrible. It was, it was horrible because, you know, now I have kids and I could never imagine doing any of this to my kids. I just can't. And, and it's hard because I even shared with you in the email as, um, as I grow, as, as I'm parenting now, I do see tendencies of my mom that I know if I don't fix this, 
th- I could lead to that, you know, like I, I'm aware of behaviors and, and so I'm doing now what I can to help prevent that, you know, and really try to break the cycle. But back to the, um, so she calls, and at this point I know about the second letter. And this is now a while after the second letter would be sent. You know, like this is like, I don't know how long after, um, definitely within a year, but I, um, she tells me about the letter. I read the letter and now I'm mad all over again. And I wasn't planning on giving my mom a second chance or, you know, a hundredth chance, but I, that definitely sealed the deal that I definitely was not gonna. And, um, it was hard a really harsh letter. I don't even remember everything. I actually still have the letter just in case, like for legal purposes. But, um, so my mom calls me and she's texting me and, um, saying like, you know, I'll come to where you are. We can, we can go to therapy. We like feeding me everything, like trying to just get back in. And, um, I knew I was done. There was no way I was going to ever be involved with her again. And so I, my husband, I remember my husband saying to me, babe, this is your chance. If you want to, like, at all the pent up, you know, stuff that you have inside, if you want to let it out, let it out. Just say whatever you want to say to her. Like, F her, say what you got to say, and that's it. And I knew in my head, like, I was... I was intelligent enough to know that I couldn't do that. That if I really wanted to be, have a clean break from her, I needed to let her be the one to say everything she's going to say and let her dig herself her own hole. I knew I didn't want to be a part of it. I didn't want to engage. I didn't want a reason to feel guilty later on. I didn't want a reason for anyone else to think that um, I had any part in it. Like I wanted it to be a clean break where it was very obvious that it wasn't me. It was her. And in order to do that, I needed to just shut up and let her say and do whatever she was going to say and do. And, but the only thing I did say was um, I had to, somehow let her know that I got that letter. Like I needed to say something. I couldn't say nothing. So what I said was something along the lines of, um, sorry, we're just cleaning, uh, my in-laws house. And, um, I found your second letter and I read it and it just reiterates why I need to not talk to you. Like it just really, you know, and, and I said something because in there, you know, she would like to compare me to my father and say that I was just like him. And I said to her in, in a text, I said, you should be lucky that I'm saying this because I'm just like my father and you should be lucky because you want nothing to do with him. So, you know, this is good. She went ballistic because I think at this at this point, I think that she put herself out there and she got denied. And she could not handle that at all. And she went off like no other. And she told me that my brother's lucky that I'm his half sister. Um, uh, she used that against me a lot. She told me how much she hated me, how she wished, how she wished uh, she never had me. She told me that um, my daughter is going to grow up to be just like me. Or no, 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 that she wished, she hoped that my daughter grows up to be just like me. And she hopes that my daughter does to me what I did to her. And, And she said that, oh, then she says, and I know that, um, she she called like you're you're a low life because you're on insurance and and this and that and then she said to me that um, you're gonna pay you're gonna pay and I didn't know what that meant 
And she, she actually left me a voicemail and told me to drop dead. And that she hopes I drop dead and that I'm going to, and it was like, I can't even explain um, the voicemail, the way she was talking. I almost like imagine her like foaming at the mouth when she was leaving this voicemail. And she, um, she told me that something like, Oh, you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to pay now. You're going to see. And now I'm freaking out because now I don't know what the hell she's going to do. And um, she winds up calling the next day, uh, you know, the government, whatever number she had to call. And she said that I was illegally on, um, again, forgetting that any time paperwork was ever handed in, it's her handwriting on the paperwork and it's her notary. (laughs) She notarized it. And um, completely, I guess, forgetting that. And uh, she called in and said that I was on it illegally and um, told them whatever she told them. And the next day, I had cops coming to my house, well, investigators, and um, that was in... 2017 and so now when when she is you know texting me and telling me that my brother is lucky that I'm just his half sister and that I'm you know disgusting and I'm garbage and I'm a piece of shit and I'm all of this I'm my brother is on his honeymoon and I was in uh you know freak out mode that I didn't know what this lady was going to do and so I'm texting him and I'll never forget, and I even, the voicemail that she left me, I sent it to him. Like, I was able to, like, send it to him, and he didn't say one word to me. He, um, he had his wife, like, be the messenger with what he was saying, and he, you know, I think maybe once he said, I'm sorry that this is going on. Um, in that moment and he never said anything and and his wife was like okay he's calling her he he's whatever like trying to you know fix the situation or whatever and put in I I know that he didn't you know have any control on her and at this point she was just in such a rage that nothing was going to stop her and so she called and she you know and now it's you know it's 2021 and there's cops still harassing me, um, saying, threatening me, telling me that they're going to arrest me. Um, I live a very scared life. Uh, I'm, they're saying I owe thousands and thousands of dollars or I'm going to be arrested. Um, just a lot of crazy things. You know, I, I'm, I was scared to, to go home with my kids. Um, cause I didn't know if, if, a cop was going to be there to arrest me in front of my kids. Um, I, up until recently, actually, uh, like a month ago, not uh, around there, a month, uh, about a month ago, um, some, the, the officer, and, and it's weird because like they'll, they'll come out of nowhere and then they'll disappear for a year and then they come back and they, they say, oh, well, you never paid the money and you're going to be arrested. And then they go away and then they come back. And and it's like this, it's it's still going on very much so. And it's it's just so crazy to know that he did that. Knowing, because she also worked for the government. So she knew what she was doing there. It's not like she thought it was just going to be I'm going to, I'm going to report this and, and nothing's going to happen. Like she knew everything she was doing and, um, she did it. And, you know, at that point, I think I almost feel like something like that needed to happen for everybody else to see, because that's, that's major, you know, that's like, now it's like a legal thing. And it was all because I didn't talk to her again, you know, like, the, the, my son was born 
a year before this. Like the, the picture was sent to her a year before she ever made a phone call, you know, and and it was like it was done strictly because I I denied her and I said no. And um, you know, I'm dealing with a lot now still because of this. Um but you know, and I and I remember too, just things keep popping up. So when my brother was getting engaged, um right before his engagement party, my mom did wind up going to the engagement party because I wasn't going. And I remember my brother saying to me, can you drop your daughter off so that mom can see her? And I was so shocked by that because we were no contact, my mother and I. And I said, you want me to drop my daughter off to my to where my abuser is. And I would call her my abuser. I said, you want me to drop her off so that my abuser could see her, but you don't want me to come. And he's like, well, I don't want to have anything bad on my conscience if something happens to her. And, you know, at this point, I mean, it, it was just like so much stuff. No, like it, it was just so much. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, I, I found a program I'm in Al-Anon and, and Maranon and, um, I'm learning to, uh, cope with, with all of this, I guess, you know, I, I don't think I've really fully dealt with anything because I was in therapy at one point and then, you know, my insurance sucks. We pay so much for insurance and there's, it just is horrible. So, um, you know, with two kids and living where I live, it's just like hard to afford therapy right now. Um, but I don't think I've ever really touched on anything really that's gone on in my life. So I haven't fully really dealt with it, but I am in a program where I am getting tools to now, you know, deal with everything. I have a sponsor and, you know, I talk with her about everything. And so right now that's, what I have and where I'm at, but, um, yeah, it's just, it was a lot of crazy, a lot. And for, uh, everyone who is listening, what words of wisdom or advice do you have people that have gone through, uh, the same thing you did growing up and not just growing up until, uh, you know, four years ago, three years ago. Um, that's a good question. I think, I think, um, the wisdom I have is, uh, you're not crazy. Um, it's not you. Um, I, I really had to, and I still do have to tell myself, um, that even though I, I did do things that weren't great as a child, it wasn't my fault, you know, like I didn't know any better. I was screaming for help. And, and so I think that the main important thing to really know in, in this type of situation is it's not you. It's not you. It is, you're not crazy. What you're thinking is most likely what it is. You know, um, they are the crazy ones and it's not your fault. And you can get away from it if, you know, like, I know it's not possible for, for everyone to go no contact. I know that that's like a hard thing to do, but there, there is help out there and, um, it's, it's, it's hard, but you're not alone and you're, you're not crazy. I think that that's the big thing is that I think me, especially I felt crazy for, so there's still times where I'll think about it and, and I'm like, Oh, like there was a time where I was like, am I, am I, uh, a narcissist? You know, am I like, is it just, is it me? And I'm just really not seeing this, but no, it's not. Everything that I went through was real. Um, I also really quick forgot to mention that I did when I was 18, tell my mom about the sexual abuse that had happened to me. and. She told me that she always 
knew, like she always felt like something had happened, um, but that there was nothing she could do about it because the statute of limitations was apparently up, which I don't even know how she knew that right then and there, but that's what she said. And she said that, you know, well, it happened to me and it is normal, not normal. She didn't say it was normal, but she said it does happen to a lot of people and you're, you're, you're going to be okay. And that was it. And then it was like, it never happened again. So, um, there's just so many things, but I know that I'm not crazy. I know. And I know that I, I know that I am a product of that though. And so there is a lot of work that I have to do today to not wind up like that. And so, um, that's definitely what I would, you know, say the most is that you're not crazy. And, and even though you might feel alone, there are people out there that have gone through this and, and are still going through it. And so I used to always feel like there's no way anybody else is going through this. There's no way. And then, you know, I found a world of people that are dealing with similar things. So that's really what I think I would, I would stress the most is you're not crazy and you're not alone. Well, Shaw, I want to thank you for showing up today and telling your story. I know you were nervous before uh, coming in here, so you did you did a great job. And thank you know, you. your story is, um, you know, it has its its twists and turns, and you mm. were, uh, you know, the victim in all of it. And now you're you uh, you're a survivor and mm-hmm. you're tough and you are where you are and now you have <laughs> you're on the road of doing the work which is its own thing and mm-hmm. um you know you don't you know a lot of us have the tendencies of, of possible uh of the people that we uh are felt were the abusers in our life and mm-hmm. you want to do your best to kind of cut those out uh or nip them in the bud um and you're on the road to mm-hmm. doing that uh, cause you recognize that there are some things. So, you know, thank you for being here, letting it all hang out and being you and you did a great job. Thank you so much. And thank you for even having something like this. You know, I think it's just so amazing for, for anyone going through it that it, it really, you know, me listening to a lot of the stories kind of just in, in a way validated it for me and, and made me feel less alone. You know, so um, I want to thank you for for having me on and, you know, um, having this platform for us people going through it or surviving it or whatever. You know, we're able to to know that other people are going through it and we're not alone. So thank you. (laughs) Well, you're welcome. And uh, (laughs) thank you for those kind words. And uh, Mm -hmm. this is it. The show is over. Um, We'll talk for a bit after this. But uh, for everyone else who's listening, for me, for me and Shaw, thank you and have a good night.